All right. So um, good evening, guys. Um, happy Independence to Nigeria. Um, so I thought it's well to have this session today, um, where we get to talk about how to analyze requirements um, effectively so that we're able to communicate in the workplace as fast as possible and as good as possible. And this relates to being a business analyst. Um, just a short intro about myself. I'm Genesis, Genesis Enwanyoku. And uh, you can get in touch with me on social media, um, most preferably LinkedIn and Twitter. On LinkedIn, it's my name, Genesis Enwanyoku. And on Twitter, you can um, reach out to me, connect with me at typical Genesis. Um, these are the places that I've worked over the years. I've worked in Digital Bananas, FinTrack, Vertebra, and currently um, at BGG Venture Garden Group. So um, today we'll be going straight to what it means to actually analyze requirements so that in order to ensure that we become much more effective in collaborating and communicating with stakeholders within a project within the initiative. So we'll be looking at a just a very brief overview of what um, business analysis is. They also touch base on what requirement analysis is, um, how to analyze requirement, looking at the various characteristics of uh, of a good requirement. Then um, how to document requirement specifications, and also how to model requirement specifications. So I'll try as much as possible. Um, this is 10 minutes after six, so I'll try as much as possible to keep this within an hour time frame. Uh, but I also do my best to be very, very clear and concise. So let's start business analysis overview. What is business analysis? So business analysis is the practice of enabling change in an enterprise by defining needs and recommending solutions that will help to deliver um, value to stakeholders. And you need to define what value is to that particular stakeholders because business analysis will enable an enterprise to, to actually understand, identify, um, articulate needs, and also the rationale for whatever initiative or change you want to implement, and to design and also to describe solutions that can deliver value to stakeholders within the context. And um, furthermore to what to it, business analysis is performed on a variety of initiatives within an enterprise. And mm -hmm. initiative in this instance could be a project. So it may be a strategic initiative. It could be a tactical initiative or an operational initiative. It could be strategic in the point that um, probably um, the organization wants to come up with a business strategy or a marketing strategy, sales strategy or product strategy, whatever strategy um, they want to uh, um, they want to implement. Um, business analysis um, works and fits perfectly into that, or it could be a tactical um, or, um, initiative that um, involves um, technology, that involves implementation of a solution. It could be an operational initiative that involves um, improving the current processes, automating a series of processes, or carefully defining the best approach to a process. So business analysis may be performed within the boundaries of a project or throughout the enterprise evolution and continuous improvement. It can be used to understand the current state and also to define the future state and to determine the activities that are required to move from the current to the future states. So uh, having said what business analysis is, so in a nutshell, who is a business analyst? A business analyst is someone who basically justifies, who um, after justifying needs to translate and then communicate. And that is why I'm looking at requirement analysis for effective communication. You need to justify the essence or the requirements for that initiative. Then you need to translate those requirements into technical specifications, which will enable you to communicate to various stakeholders within the initiative. So 
from there we go down to what a requirement what requirement analysis is the comment analysis um is a practice oh so sorry i think i i i made a mistake here sorry about that um so requirement analysis basically is all about um understanding the basic um approach and needs of stakeholders within a particular initiative so um what is a requirement to be the most important thing for you to ask what is a requirement a requirement basically is an is a representation of a need presentation of what um this uh, the solution um, needs to 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 be um, satisfied successful and there are different types of requirements there are business requirements stakeholder requirements solution requirements and transition requirements business requirements on its own is just basically a statement of goals is a statement of object objectives and also outcomes that will help to describe why a change has been initiated and they can apply to a whole of an enterprise to a business area or to a specific initiative why stakeholder requirement which happens to be um, um, um most of the things we try to gather when we uh, when we go for requirement elicitation tries to describe the needs of the stakeholders that must be met in order to achieve the business requirement. And this need may serve as a bridge between the business and the solution requirement. Then the solution requirements describe the qualities and capabilities of a solution that meets the stakeholder requirement. So you understand what the stakeholder wants, you understand what the users want, what the client wants. So what will be the capabilities that the system needs to have? What sort of features, what sort of functionalities, what sort of qualities and conditions should the system meet so that it could satisfy the needs of stakeholders. So solution requirements provide the appropriate level of detail in order to allow for development and implementation of the solution. And solution requirements can basically be divided into two categories. We have the functional requirements and we have the non-functional requirements. Functional requirements um, talks about the capabilities that the solution must have in terms of its behavior and information that the solution will manage. Why the non-functional requirements, or you could call it quality of service requirements, um, they do not relate directly to the behavior or functionality of the solution, but rather they describe conditions under which a solution must meet to remain effective or qualities that the solution must have. You can con consider your non-functional requirement as things that help to spice up and to make your system very, very um, valuable to end users, or that will help to retain the quality of the system's service. So um, um, down to transition requirements, which is a um, fourth type of requirement. This describes the capabilities that the solution must have and the conditions the solution must meet to facilitate the transition from whatever current state it is to the future state it desires to be. But these transition requirements, um, they won't be required or needed once that change has been complete. So once we are transiting from a particular situation, which we can term a current state, to a part to the at another situation which we could term a future state, um, these transition requirements will no longer be necessary any longer. They won't they won't they won't be useful uh, or won't be needed any longer in the course of the solution life cycle. So they are basically differentiated from other requirement types because they are temporary in nature, and transition requirements helps to address topics such as data conversion, such as training and business continuity. And typical examples of transfer requirements are training manuals, um, the policies, um, the user acceptance um, testing um, documentation, such as the test case, test case or UAT script. So I've not understood what, requirement, um, what um, types of requirements is. So what is requirement analysis? Requirement analysis describes how business anal analysts prioritize and also progressively elaborate stakeholder and solution requirements in order to enable the project team to implement 
a solution that will meet the needs of the sponsoring organization and stakeholders. So let me break this down into um, more details. So requirement analysis basically is how a BA tends to prioritize requirements and not just stopping at prioritizing those requirements, but continuously, constantly, progressively elaborating the stakeholder requirements and the stake and the solution requirements in order to enable every member of the project team to implement a solution that will meet the needs of the sponsoring organization and stakeholders. So um, requirement analysis is significant and is a significant and also an essential activity after the elicitation activity. Because the BA will need to analyze, will need to refine, will also need to scrutinize the requirements that have been gathered in order to make consistent and unambiguous requirements with the use of uh, specialized tools and techniques. And this activity reviews all the requirements and usually provides a graphical view of the entire system. And after the completion of the requirement analysis, it is expected that the level of understanding of the project will improve significantly. And at this point, the BA who keeps constant interaction with the customer to clarify points of confusion and also to understand which requirements are more important than other requirements. Requirement analysis basically requires a good level of attention to details and, and ensuring that no requirement is left in isolation or not properly specified. High quality requirements are mostly documented actionable, measurable, trace, uh, traceable, testable, and also helps to identify business opportunities that are defined to facilitate system design. And it is very, very important that the BA specifies the requirements, the BA gains validation from stakeholders, and then he or she also go further ahead to modeling the requirements to help provide better clarity to the technical team. And technical team in this instance, basically talk about the software dev, network, um, front-end designers, and um, back-end design database, and all. So how do we actually analyze requirements? Uh, which is one of the key things we'll be looking in the session today. How do we, have, how do we actually analyze requirements? Because analyzing requirements could be very, very taxing and also difficult uh, at, at times. Uh, but with the use of the right approach, it can become very easy and seamless. And every requirement for you to be properly analyzed needs to have the following characteristics. So for us to say that this requirement has been analyzed or how we've actually analyzed the particular requirements, we need to ensure that the requirement has these following characteristics. Uh, the first on the list is that your requirement needs to be atomic. And it need, after being atomic, it needs to be uniquely identified. It needs to be complete. It needs to be um, traceable. It needs to be consistent and unambiguous. It needs to be prioritized and it needs to be testable. So when you write a requirement, you need to ensure that that requirement you have written meets all of these criteria for you to know that you have uh, effectively analyzed that particular requirement. So um, let's take all of these characteristics one after the other for us to understand what they mean in the con context of requirement analysis. So being atomic, um, for requirement being atomic, um, each and every requirement you have should be atomic, which means it should be at very low level of details and it should not be possible to separate out into different components. Um, yeah, to run us through or to explain this um, characteristics of requirements, we'll be looking at uh, a system that is built for the educational domain. So we'll be looking at an educational portal, how users will be able to interact and make use of the system and how as a BA to capture the requirements um, appropriately for effective communication. So let's look at a typical example of atomicity. So, We'll look at the bad example and look at the good example. So we have students will be able to enroll to undergraduate and postgraduate courses. Um, 
the thing is that this is a particularly bad requirement and because it is not atomic and it talks about two different entities um undergraduate and postgraduate courses so obviously it's not a good requirement but a bad requirement and that is because it has two entities lumped into one particular requirement and the best way to actually represent this requirement will be for you to separate them out to put them separately by saying that students will be able to enroll to undergraduate courses which is one requirement on its own and the next requirement will also be that the students will be able to enroll to postgraduate studies so in this instance one talks about the enrollment to undergraduate courses while the other talks about the enrollment to postgraduate courses then what does it mean for your requirements to be uniquely identified? Um, looking at another example of a bad requirement that has not been identified uniquely. When you say students will be able to enroll to undergraduate studies, yeah? Students will be able to enroll to a postgraduate studies. Yeah, perfectly, you'll be able to um, express them in their atomic nature, but you can't, they, um, they, they've not been able, you've not been able to identify those um requirements uniquely in the sense that we are giving them the same id number so yeah we have two separate requirements but both have the same id number one so if you are referring our requirements with reference to id number it is not clear which uh, which exact requirement we are referring to in the document or other part of the system as both of these requirements have the same id number one so it is very very important for us as business analysts to separate out our requirements with unique identification numbers. So a good requirement will be that the first one, which is cost enrollment, uh, it's going to have two requirements, which has to be that one by 1.1, I did uh, is enrollment, uh, students will be able to enroll to undergraduate studies. The 1.2 will be students will be able to enroll to postgraduate studies. So this way you've been able to uniquely identify your requirements and in the future when you are making reference to your requirements you can refer to them with their id with their unique id um, numbers then uh, the next characteristic is for a requirement to be complete and each and every requirement should be complete as possible and in the example given in the bad um, requirements in red it says that a professor will log into the system by providing his username providing his password and other relevant information. Here, yeah, the other relevant information that has been stated in this particular requirement is not clear because um, uh, the other relevant information could be his age, could be his um, gender, it could be his um, height, it could be his complexion, it could be his um, address. Uh, so it's not actually clear or specific on what the other um, relevant information would be. So the other relevant information should be spelled out clearly and are seen in good requirements to make the requirement complete. So in green, we have a good requirement that says that a professor user will log into the system by providing his username, his password, and his department code. So in that way, you'll be able to clearly specify all of the inputs parameter or data points that will be needed for a professor user to successfully log into the system so whenever the information is not clearly stated this can result to a lot of scope creep or bad implementation of the business needs by the technical team and when all of this happens it all comes down to the table of the ba because um every member of the team will be like let's look at what the requirement says now when they look at the requirement and they find out that the requirement did not actually specify or the technical team followed the um requirements that have been documented by the business analyst line upon line and realize that um that is where the mistake actually um emanated from hence it becomes a very bad um um um, um representation of the business analyst. So let's go to the next one, which is a requirement being consistent and unambiguous. So um, looking at the bad requirement in red, it says a student will have either undergraduate courses or postgraduate courses, but not both. 
And also, it still went further to say some courses will be open to both undergraduate and postgraduate students. So the problem in this requirement is that from the first requirement, it seems that the courses are divided into two categories, undergraduate courses and postgraduate courses. And students can opt either of the two, but not both. But when you read the other requirement, it tends to conflict with the first requirement. And it tells that some courses uh, within the um, um, school will be open to both postgraduate and undergraduate. And this is a very good example. This is a very this is a very good example of a bad requirement because you have a requirement that is up telling you that um, um, courses uh, students will have both undergraduate and postgraduate um, courses, and they can never ever have both. Then you now have lower and below it. You have another requirement that counters or negates what you are negates what you are. Um, what you stated in your first requirement. But to have a good requirement, you, you um, on the green side, we have it that a student will have either undergraduate courses or postgraduate courses. And in this way, we've been able to uh, ensure that it's not ambiguous and it's consistent as possible. So the next one is to ensure that your requirement is traceable. And um, each and every requirement should be traceable because they are already different levels of requirements. Now, when we convert uh, business requirements to um, requirement types, um, sorry about that. So when we convert business requirements into requirement types, there has to be uh, some sort of traceability, which means that we should be able to take each and every business requirement and map it to the corresponding one or more software requirements. Um, in our example above, we see that um, the bad requirement that says that maintain student information mapped to BRD requirement ID. So here it basically does not state um, the actual ID of that particular um, requirement. So how do we actually trace that requirement? So um, converting it to a good requirement, it says the same thing, but it is mapped with a requirement ID number. So the good requirement says maintain student information mapped to BRD requirement, and uh, BRD requirement ID 3.1 or 4.1 as the case may be. So mapping should be between system and integration requirements up to the code that eventually implements that particular requirement. And also, there is mapping between the system and integration requirement to the test case, which tests that particular requirement. When, um, when the quality assurance or tester wants to actually test the software or test the solution, he or she will basically request for the um, requirement documentation to ensure that each of the test cases are mapped to each of the requirements. And how this is done is through traceability. By the time your requirements are uniquely identified with ID numbers, um, the tester can easily map those test cases to those requirements IDs. So the next one is for you to ensure that your requirements always stays prioritized. And this is because every requirement must be prioritized so that the team has guidelines to reach requirements that will be able to implement, for, that it will be able to implement first and uh, which can be done later on in the course of the project. And here you can see that a bad priority has registered students, maintain user information, enroll courses, build a uh, report card with a priority of one. And in this point, you are more or less like telling the implementation team that all of these things, people need to implement them at once because they all are very, 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 very important. And this will uh, make the team to run into a lot of friction and time constraints. But when you're able to prioritize your requirement, like we have in the green one, um, register students to take the priority one, maintain user information with priority two, enroll courses, priority one, and view report card as priority three, this will help the implementation team to understand that the first thing they need to ensure they get in place for the solution is the registration and the, the, the student registration and the enrollment of courses. And after that, the next thing you'll have to take up will be the user information maintenance. And then the last thing you have to do 
obey the view and um, the report card view. So in that way, when you prioritize your requirements, it will help the implementation team and guide them to implement in phases um, one after the other. Now, the, la um, the last one, which is your requirements being testable. So um, every requirement should be testable. And in the bad requirements, we have it that each page of the system will load in an acceptable time frame. And the problem with this is that um, the page meaning that there can be many pages which are going to blow up the testing effort. And the other problem is that um, you talk about the page going to load in an acceptable time frame. Now, what exactly is the acceptable time frame? And what, how can you define acceptable? Who is it acceptable to? So we can have to convert the non-testable argument into testable argument, which specif uh, specifically tells us about which page we are talking about, whether it is a registered student or a row courses pages. And the acceptable time frame is also given with, um, with a value. So looking at the good um, requirements on the right-hand side, in green, it says register students and enroll courses pages of the system will load within five seconds. So this will help whoever is testing the solution or testing this page or testing this interface to ensure that the um, to, to, to validate if the pages load um, within five seconds or beyond five seconds. So these are the ways you will to know that your requirements are well um, analyzed and they are well um, documented to help convey and communicate um, value to respective stakeholders within the course of the project. So since we know the characteristics of um, this requirement or, or characteristics of a good requirement, um, let's look at what it takes to document requirement specification. So, Documenting requirements specification. After you've been able to analyze your requirements, there's need for you to actually document your requirements. So um, the formal way um, to document a business need as a requirement is with a single sentence of a, a, of a shall statement. An example is this. A customer shall be able to transfer funds between their accounts. So a complete set of high-level requirements are expected to be elicited from and also signed off by designated stakeholders. As a BA, when you carry out your elicitation activities, you also, you also need to ensure that when you elicit those um, uh, requirements, you document them, and you also share those um, documents with stakeholders who have approval level, or stakeholders who you actually um, uh, capture the requirements from, for them to um, sign off on the requirements. So as even the project continues, those high-level requirements acts, act as the context for detailed requirements. And the details behind each of the high-level requirements are further elicited from subject matter experts, known as SMEs. And the, these particular details we've gotten from SMEs are then used as the Bible throughout the life cycle of the project in order to support the design, to support the development, and also testing. And the shout statement is used to represent your high-level requirements. Hence, uh, we also have more detailed requirements depending on the level of abstraction. Uh, and this mostly takes different structures. And some of these um, detailed requirements are user stories, use case scenarios, and story points. So um, there are several artifacts that you can use to specify your requirements. And this artifact basically comes in different forms and formats. And most times in the project, um, the approach of the project management will determine the type of documents that you will mostly um, use to capture your requirements. So some of these require, um, artifacts that are used to capture requirements are the BRD, which is the business requirement document, the FRD, known as the functional requirement document, the SRS, which is the software requirement specifications, and also the EPICS and user stories log. There are different other um, requirements, um, documentation or requirement artifacts that are used to capture um, both stakeholder and solution requirements. So let's um, take a look at 
um, uh, business requirements document, which is BRD. So um, BRD is a document that basically outlines the need, the scope, the goals, and stakeholders' um, requirements of what the initiative aims to achieve. Uh, they are basically written to define the requirements of a business process or a system that needs to support a business process. The business requirement document contains the business requirements that are to be met and fulfilled by the system under development. And these requirements specify what the system must do in order to fulfill the requirements of the business. The BRD is majorly used in a waterfall process to gain requirement approval from stakeholders in the case in, uh, in, the, in the case the client or business manager. Um, before the BA would go, then go ahead to prepare the functional requirement document, which is the FRD, some also call it functional requirement specification, FRS, which basically talks about um, the technicalities that are required in the implementation of the solution. So what is an FRD, the, the functional requirements um, document? This basically defines how the system will accomplish the requirements by outlining the functionalities and also the features that will be supported by the system. And ideally, the functionality of the system will be described in logical terms so that the FRD is technology and platform dependent. And this gives the architects and the developers more freedom in making development and design decisions about the physical design of the system. So you also need to know that, I uh, have it at the back of your mind, that your FRD captures most of the models that represents the solution flow, that represents the functionalities, and also the data flows. Then we look at the SRS, which is Software Requirement Specification. And this is a description of an organization's understanding of customers or a potential client's system requirement and dependencies. Um, the initial purpose of the SRS is to ensure that the provider, which is the customer, understands the client, um, which is the vendor, understands the customer or the client requirements prior to any actual design or development. The SRS states the precise and explicit language um, of all functions and capabilities, as well as the constraints by which the software must ensure to be abide, to abide rather. The, um, the SRS functions as a blueprint for completing a project with as little cost um, growth as possible. And it is often referred to as the parent document because all subsequent uh, project requirement documents, uh, such as the design specification, the statement of work, the architectural specifications, the testing and validation plans are derived from the SRS. And from the SRS, let's go down to, um, to Epic and user stories. And Epic in itself, is a large body of work that can be broken down into a number of smaller stories. It helps the team to stay focused on the overall objectives of the project. Epics are few in number, and they take longer time to complete, and they may not be able to, have to be achieved in one particular iteration. User stories, on the other hand, are short, simple descriptions of a feature that is being told from the perspective of the person who desires the new capability and at this stage is mostly a user or a customer of the system. And the user story uh, follows a typical template, a, typ a typical template or structure which says, as a type of user, I want to be able to uh, take an action so that I could achieve some results. And looking at the example of an e-learning portal to illustrate this, which says, as a student, I want to be able to log in with my student ID and password so that I can have access to my student portal. So um, the user here is a student. Um, the action they want to do is to log in with their user, uh, student ID and password. And the result they want to achieve is to have access to their student portal. User stories uh, is an agile development, uh, in an agile development of, uh, environment are managed within a story backlog by either a by a product owner. 
And ideally, this person is available to participate as a member of the development team. And new stories can be written at any point in time during the course of the initiative. And um, the last one will be looking in terms of specifying requirements are acceptance criteria. Acceptance criteria um, involves specifying the requirements that must be met for a solution to be considered acceptable to stakeholders. It entails defining the data input and output, defining the qualities and the quality attributes, and also the system functionalities that are necessary for the user to accept the system. There are basically two most common types of acceptance criteria. We have the rule-based and the scenario-based acceptance criteria. For the rule-based uh, acceptance criteria, um, these are basically represented using business rules. And uh, for the scenario-based acceptance criteria, these are basically represented using Jenkins syntax. And it explains the necessary conditions and criteria that must be fulfilled for a user story to be valid. Your um, Gherkin syntax helps to provide the logic for implementation and supports the behavioral driven design approach. Uh, it has this whole unique structure and it follows um, that of just a user story, such as given that a condition, when I perform a certain activity, then a particular rule needs to apply. So this uh, particular um, structure is what your acceptance criteria will need to follow. For example, using the user stories of, um, as I said earlier, for someone logging in with a student ID and password. So you said, given that I am a student or I'm an active student, when I enter with, when I log in with my valid student ID and password, then this, then my student portal should, then I should be granted access to my student portal. So you could have a Gherkin syntax that basically supports the business and um, the user stories that was just stated earlier on. Now, after specifying our requirements, we'll, the, the next thing we need to do as business analysts in the course of the project will be to model our uh, requirements. So we go to requirements modeling. So what is requirements modeling? This basically is a collection of diagrams that is used to model software from the business analysis perspective. Collection of diagrams that you use to model a particular software solution from the business analysis perspective. And your requirements models get inputs from your um, requirements that you have basically specified. So um, a requirement is just basically a statement that says what functions you must you want the software to do. And specifying this requirement is not just sufficient to communicate the core attributes and capabilities of the system to all of the stakeholders. And that is why it is very important to design models that will help create a visual representation of the system capabilities and processes. And some of the reasons why requirements are, um, are modeled are one, requirements, model, uh, requirements models allow us to organize our data in multiple ways because we have different ways of modeling requirements. So it helps to organize our data in different ways. Uh, it helps us to see things that might be missing at the point of specifying the requirement. And it also helps us to create a visual representation of what we expect from the system. Models help us to help to provide us with more analysis on the various components of the requirements of the system. And before you can correctly model, before you can correctly model your requirements, you must ensure that your specifications are concise and accurate. And requirement modeling starts with the use case diagram, then to the data modeling and then flow, um, flow diagrams and also the class diagram. Example of the use case diagram is normal use case diagram. Data modeling could be your context diagram or your level one DFD diagram. We also have processor diagram to represent your flow diagram. And we also have the entity relationship diagram to represent your class diagram. So um, let's look at your use case um, diagram. So you're looking at UML use case. And this basically helps to capture 
the use cases, and also their relationship amongst actors and the system. They basically describe the functional requirements of the system and also the manner in which the external operators interact at the system boundary and the response of the system. The use case, the UML use case diagram basically comprises four core components, which are the use cases, the actors, the relationships, and the system boundaries. So what are the use cases? Uh, these are the sequence of actions that provide a measurable value to a particular actor or user of the system. A use case can be drawn as a horizontal ellipse on a UML use case. And this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this is an example of a use case um, open accounts, deposit funds, withdraw funds, close accounts. So the use case names begins with a strong verb such as open or deposit or withdraw or close. And name the name uses um, the, and you need to ensure you name your use cases using the terminologies of that particular domain you're working. I uh, also ensure you place your primary use case in the, uh, at the particular top of your diagram and you need to imply timing considerations when actually stacking your use case. Now, what this means is when you are um, stacking your use cases, as we see here, you need to imply timing consideration by looking at what should the user do first before doing this other thing. So do you want the user to deposit funds before they open accounts? No. So the first thing the user will need to do is to open accounts, thereafter deposit funds, and when you deposit, you'll be able to withdraw, and then you can close your account. So um, you need to ensure that timing considerations are put in place when stacking your use cases. And then the next component is the actor. And an actor is a person or an organization or external system that plays a role in one or more interactions with your system. And some of the rules of um, when drawing your actors in use cases, you need to ensure you draw actors to the outside of a use case diagram. Your actors are not drawn inside your um, use case, I mean, inside your um, subsystem. You need to ensure that you name your actors with singular business relevant nouns. You also need to associate each actor with one or more use cases. And also, your actor, model, uh, your actor need to, you need to ensure that your actor basically models the roles of the various users and not their positions. And also, um, you need to ensure you use um, your greater and um, your less than and greater than sign to indicate um, an actor that represents a system, such as a payment gateway or another system you know that will be interacting with your own system. Actors don't basically interact with one another, but you can introduce an actor that could be called a time in order for you to schedule and event or list of events that will occur within a system. Then the next components we'll be looking at are relationships. And these are the different types. Um, there are different types of relationships that may appear on a use case diagram. The um, first one of these is an association. And an association between an actor and a use case, such as we have students being associated with enrolled students, which is a use case. We also have association between two use cases. A good example will be um, enroll students and enroll in seminar or enroll, um, uh, sorry, a good example would be um, enroll students and uh, enroll um, family member. We also have generalization between two actors and also generalization between two use cases. A very good example of association between um, two use cases could be extend and include relationships. And the basic rules for um, you when drawing your relationships is that one, you need to avoid all forms of arrowheads on actor use case relationship. Avoid more than two levels of use case associations. Place an included use case to the right of the invoking use case. You also need to place an extending use case below the parent's use case. And then place an inheriting use case below the base use case. And finally, you need to place an inheriting actor below the parent actor. The last component of a, of a UML use case diagram we're looking at is the system boundary. And this basically is just a rectangle that we draw around the use cases. And um, as the name suggests, it indicates the scope of your system. 
and the use cases inside the rectangle represent the functionality that you intend to represent or implement. And you also need to ensure that you avoid any form of meaningless system boundary boxes. So from use case diagram, you're going over to context diagram. Context diagram shows the system that you are actually is under consideration as a single high level process and then shows the relationship that the system has with other entities. And entities at this point could be systems, could be organizational groups, could be external data sources, could be actors of the system. Another name for context diagram is a context level data flow diagram or a level zero data flow diagram. A data flow diagram, just to give you more explanation or context in this, is a graphical representation of the movement of data through an information system. DFDs are one of the three essential components of the structured system analysis and design method, which is SSADM. And a DFD is a process centric, is process um, centric, and it depicts four main components. One, which is the processes that are represented by circles. We have the external entities that are represented by a rectangle. We have the data stores, which could be two horizontal lines or parallel lines, or sometimes an ellipse. Then we have the data flows, which could be the curved or straight line with arrowhead that indicates the flow direction or the data flow direction. So what, why do we actually need to have our context diagram as B or to model the context diagram? Some of the benefits of the context diagram is that it shows the scope of the system, the scope and the boundaries of a system at a glance, including the other systems that interface with it. Uh, you basically may not need any technical knowledge uh, for you to understand a context diagram. It is very easy to draw and, it's, and also to amend it uh, under limited notation. It is easy to expand by adding different levels of data flow diagram and you can benefit a wide and it can also benefit a wide range of audience including stakeholders business analysts the data analysts the developers a context diagram provides no information about timing that's very very important it gives no impo information about sequencing or synchronization of a process such as which um, processes occur in sequence or in parallel therefore it should not be confused with a flow chart or with a process flow, which can show all of these timing and sequences of activities within the system. So how do we actually draw a context diagram? First, we need to ensure we identify the data flows by listing out the major documents and information flows that will be associated with the system. And then we identify external entities by identifying their various sources and recipients of the data flows. Then we draw and label a process box that represents the entire system. We also draw and label the external entities around the outside of the process box. And then we add the data flows between the external entities and the system box. So here is a typical example of a context diagram. Uh, we have uh, this being an online community, we have external entities uh, which such as um, community users advertisers, accountants, and staff writers. So this basically shows the data flow, data flowing from the system, this is the online community, to community users, and data that comes from the community users to the system, which happens to be registration data from the system, and also the users get information and tools from the online communities. And same goes with um, the staff writers, the accountants, and the advertisers. So look at the data um, inputs and outputs for between the system and its external entities. That basically is what a context diagram is. And this is a very good typical uh, representation of a context diagram. So let's go to the next one, which is a process flow diagram. That happens to be the last um, um, requirements modeling um, we'll be looking at today. So a process flow diagram is used to indicate the general flow of system processes. And it, display, it displays the relationship between major users and components of a system. It can be drawn using your flow chart symbols. 
So um, the process flow diagram has different symbols. We have the start and end, which we have here, the curved um, rectangle, and uh, this is used to represent the start and the end of a process. We have the rectangle itself, which is used to represent an activity or a process. We also have the decision, um, which looks like a diamond and is used to represent condition points where decisions need to be made. We have the sub process, which is a um, rectangle with two internal um, uh, with two with two in internal vertical lines, and this is used to represent a group of processes that feeds into another process. We have the input that use that represents data input activities into the system. We have the document that is used to represent a document that is generated like receipts. We also have the database. Um, 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 icon or stencil, which is used to represent a storage object or a location. Then we have the external database that is used to um, represent the external um, storage points. We have the references, which is on-page and off-page reference. On-page is used to represent um, a particular information or data or process that exists within the same page of the um, process flow diagram. An off page represents an activity or process that is outside the same page of the diagram. Then we have the horizontal swim lane. We have the vertical swim lane. We also have the horizontal separator. When you are drawing, when you are um, using your vertical swim lane, you use your horizontal separator. And when you are using your horizontal swim lane, you use your vertical separators. So um, what are the basic rules when drawing your um, process flow diagrams? You need to let data ensure that your data flow from left to right. Uh, you need to place return lines under, under the flow of the diagram. And each process should have a verb and a noun. Every arrow must have a head in order to indicate the direction of the flow. And arrows should not cross each other. You need to try as much as possible to ensure that your arrows does not cross each other. So here is a typical example of a process flow diagram for an e-voting platform, how um, people actually cast their votes. So we look at, here we are using a horizontal swim lane, and we look at the various, um, we are look, we're looking at the various um, lanes which has to do with the eligible voters and the system, and it starts by the, um, eligible voters logging into the system, resetting their password, if it's a first time login, uh, if it's not a first time login, continue to um, view the list of contestants, and then the eligible voter flows into all through the process involved and looking at the condition points of validations and uh, also verifications that are necessary before finally sending or submitting their votes and the system sends them their vote receipts as a document and then the process ends in that particular point so that basically brings us to the end of the um session as i said out I, I was i only there to try as much as possible to make it um within a one hour period so we don't go beyond an hour for this session so do you have any question or any clarification or something feel free to Ask or probably um, type in the in the um, in the message box.